Welcome everyone to our webinar today. This webinar is called Eating for Prostate Health, Sexual Health and Heart Health. I'm Dr. Stacy Loeb and I will be your host tonight along with Dr. Adam Murphy from Northwestern. This event is part of a kickoff for the Black Men's Prostate Cancer Initiative webinar series. And we are really glad to have all of you joining us today. The Black Men's Prostate Cancer Initiative is designed to decrease health outcome disparities in prostate cancer treatment in the Black community through support and education. For those of you who are new to us too as an organization, Adam and I are happy to be board members. The goal of us too is to help men with prostate cancer learn to fight the disease. The power of us too is in helping men and those who love them by transforming resignation into determination and fear into hope. If you'd like more information, you can go to the website at www.us2.org. So to those of you who I've not met before, I'm Dr. Stacy Loeb. I'm a professor of urology and population health in New York City. I work at New York University and the Manhattan VA. And my grandfather had prostate cancer, which is what got me into this field. I've had the great honor and pleasure of being acquainted with Dr. Adam Murphy for probably about 15 years, let's say. We don't want to age ourselves. And he's a fantastic urologist and friend. He is an assistant professor of urology and preventive medicine at Northwestern University, also on staff at Cook County Health and the Jesse Brown VA. And we're delighted to be your host this evening with two really just superstar guests. We are so excited that they agreed to join us. We have Dr. Columbus Batiste, who's a board certified interventional cardiologist and assistant clinical professor at the University of California, Riverside School of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Batiste. Also joining us is Dr. Ed McDonald, who's an assistant professor in gastroenterology at the University of Chicago the Associate Director of Adult Nutrition, and an instructor in culinary medicine. So amazing. Welcome, Dr. McDonald. Great. So we are going to jump right in with the webinar. We do want to, of course, thank our sponsors, the Pfizer Foundation, Janssen, and the State of Illinois. So let's start out by having each of the speakers maybe talk a little bit about your background and how you became interested in nutrition. I can go first. Thank you. So I became interested in nutrition, um, you know, really years ago. I was always interested in cooking. Uh, I had two grandmothers that were wonderful matriarchs and taught me the joy of cooking back when I was a young kid. And uh, my mother, when I was younger, she was frequently hospitalized. So she had health issues and I frequently had to cook on my own. So I was cooking ever since I was, you know, probably 10 years old or so. And then fast forward, I ended up working at a couple different restaurants. I was a manager at McDonald's and I saw families who would come into McDonald's every single day for every single meal. And I knew that that wasn't really healthy. So what I ended up doing, I started making uh, stuff off menu. Uh, and I basically um, became known as having a uh, cooking repertoire. Uh, my McDonald's actually had a secret menu. So um, eventually when I went to medical school, I found that a lot of the healthcare issues that people were facing were connected with food. And from there, I decided to, you know, really dedicate my life to studying that connection and also not only studying it, but being in a way where I can educate patients uh, on how to prove their lives through the connection between food and health. Fantastic. Let's go over to you, Dr. Batiste. Yeah, no, very similar in that I, you know, I grew up loving sports, but I also grew up under my mom's coattails a little bit inside the, uh, the kitchen. 
So I, I learned the craft and the art of putting some food together and learning how to cook. And my family hails from New Orleans, so a lot of different cuisine that, that was there. I kind of would characterize my, my years growing up as a fast food junkie with standards, you know, is essentially what I was, and <clears throat> which is problematic. And so we had somewhat of a, an under, a distinct understanding and really an intention in terms of nutrition. My dad owned a health food store, so vitamins, all these things. But then on the other side, the, pra- the actual actions were discordant with that on a regular basis in terms of the foods that were eaten. And so as I grew older, went through med school, I watched my brother at the age of 50, who's uh, a bit older than I am, I was a pleasant surprise, develop prostate cancer. You know, and then later on, that was the initial trick. That was initial trigger. Patients asking me about, what, "Hey, doc, what should I eat?" was the second trigger. And the last final straw that broke the camel's back was watching my dad pass away from really a lifestyle preventable disease, and watching him just wither away over the years and being left helpless despite um, all the the medications and technology that we have. And that's what propelled me down this road. Oh, wow. Those are really cool answers. I mean, I feel like um, we all kind of come to our uh, kind of careers even and our passion projects based off of kind of what history brought us to. Um, I have, a, I'm a prostate cancer uh, person. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a person who has prostate cancer in their family and their father and grandfather, kind of like you, Stacey, uh, and really come at this uh, because of the lack of health disparities, uh, knowledge that it was in um, the black community. I kind of felt like um, we really needed to do a better job of educating the community about prostate cancer. And so I'm excited to really be a part of this too and co-hosting this with you. Um, I have a question though, for our, our, our esteemed panelists, you all are talking about kind of the dietary exposures you all had as young people being impacted by the kind of negative uh, kind of food choice that people and patients were making around you. So are you guys plant-based diet eaters? What do you eat? Yeah, no, great question. I'll chime in and jump in here first. You know, I am a whole food plant-based foodie, so to speak, you know, and that was easy transition for me. So, it's a horribly demoralizing type of situation to watch someone pass away. And we do it as clinicians frequently, but it's different when it's up close and personal to you. And so watching my father pass away, it was a hard, it was a hard scenario. And so when I saw him like that, it, it actually caused me to go into a bit of a, of a depression. But fortunately, because of resiliency, I really began to search and research and look. And what I realized is that it's not a label. It's about the quality of foods that, that a person eats that can really be the secret sauce, the missing link towards illness and, and, and wellness. And so that's what caused me to really go down the road of a whole food plant-based diet because the plant-based diet is one in which it is a minimally processed plants and uh, without additives and things of that nature. But that's what caused me to go down that road. So no meat at all, right? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just thought it might be helpful for Dr. Batista to give a little bit more information about what a plant-based diet is. So what are the kinds of foods that you're eating when you say whole foods, plant-based? Yeah. So that's the cool part, right? Is that when we, you, you adopt foods like this, these are foods that are culturally diverse around the world, right? So you're looking at root foods. If, you, if you're speaking about Africa, you're looking at corn and maize. If you're inside of Latin countries. You're, if you go where my family's from inside New Orleans, it's red beans and rice. Those are all plant-rich foods. So beans and or legumes and grains, and you're looking at vegetables, things that make you chew, things I like to joke around. I mean, of uh, Adam, you and Stacy, you guys are known by singular names because you have a celebrity status, like Madonna, like, like uh, A-Rod, like all these folks like that. So I, I always tell folks, eat foods with singular names, broccoli, kale, red beans, rice, that's, that, that's the approach. Those are really the foods that, that uh, health is really made of. I think you're talking, my mother wants to pay you to say that actually. That was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Ed? <laughs> what do you eat, Dr. McDonald? 
Yeah. So, you know, my story is, is, is fairly similar. And, you know, to back up a little bit, one of the reasons where I really got into nutrition, uh, I grew up here in Chicago. So I remember going to church and, you know, hearing these stories about people being sick and shut in with, you know, diabetes, uh, various types of cancer. And I would see people at, at church uh, who went blind from diabetes, who's had limbs cut off. And as a kid, you know, going to church and seeing that was very traumatic. Like where I, I remember asking me, people asking me to pray for folks who were having, all, you know, all these issues. And I was always inquisitive as a child. So not only did I pray, but I asked a question. I'm like, why are people getting these issues? And, you know, I remember some folks are saying, oh, they just eat real bad. And that's something that stuck with me throughout medical school. And um, even as a medical student, I was one of the few African-American men in my class. And I remember sitting in the front row and I would hear about all these conditions, including prostate cancer that affect black men the most. And I remember asking the question, you know, what can we do about it? And most of the lecturers, you know, they would look at me again, the only black man in the class um, and say, well, you just have to eat right. But the issue was no one would ever define what eating right was. Uh, it was almost like a mystery. People just said, eat this this right way uh, without actually educating us on what that right way was, whether or not there was a single right way or multiple ways that are, quote unquote, right, if you will. So for my dietary pattern, uh, similar to Columbus, uh, Dr. Baptiste, I am, um, you know, mostly on a whole food plant based diet. Uh, however, you know, on, on rare occasions, especially being a chef, I may eat some fish every now and again. But if you had to look at what I eat at as a, as a whole, it definitely be a vegetarian plant, whole food plant based diet. So, you know, this is a little off, but you there are panelists I and mean, people who are in the audience now uh, asking about, you know, we can afford to eat a plant based diet is the conjecture, right? That uh, we can go to Whole Foods and spend our whole paycheck. What about the cost of the plant-based diet? Do you think that's a real issue or what's going on? Well, I mean, it depends on what you're buying, but the cost of eating meat is also expensive too. I mean, last time I checked, asparagus is not $19 a pound, but salmon, you know, can be, or even $10 a pound. So when you start buying chicken and some of these meats, if you look at how much they cost, they, they do cost a lot per pound. And then the cost of the food is not the only cost that you're paying, okay? So you have to think about the impact of the food on your health and the costs associated with that. Uh, so the unseen costs um, involved with the food that you're eating, those are real. Um, and also cost per nutrient, okay? So you're buying food, you're paying not only for the food itself, but you're paying for the nutrients. And cost per nutrient, uh, a whole foods plant-based diet is definitely one of the cheaper diets to be on. And I give you a good story. I was doing a cooking demonstration at a, a farmer's market here on the South side. And someone asked me that same question. They were like, Dr. McDonald, you're talking about eating all these vegetables, but this stuff is expensive. Now, as the man said that, he was drinking a, uh, a bottle of Coca-Cola that he got from a vending machine. And my response was, well, how much did that Coca-Cola cost? And he said, you know, this was, uh, it was a big bottle. So he said it was a, like $2 or something like that. And, and he looked at the blueberries and, and the blueberries were $3. And I'm like, well, you know, those blueberries have nutrients that are helpful for your body. That Coca-Cola doesn't have anything that's really helpful uh, and may even be potentially harmful, but that costs $2, okay? So you can pay a dollar extra um, if you did not spend that $2, pay your $3 and buy the blueberries, and now you're getting access to the nutrients and all the plant-based chemicals that may, uh, you know, serve a healthy purpose in your body. So when I think about costs, I think about the global picture and I also think about not only the cost to your wallet, but also the cost of the environment, okay? Uh, the environmental costs associated with food is real. We may, we may not necessarily recognize the immediate cost, but the long-term impact is something that we all should be aware of. And majority I mean, of the Do you have anything you wanted to add to this topic? You know, I'll, I'll chime in just because Ed laid it out very well. The one thing I'd add in is the fact that there is some significant validity to that question of cost. And we see this because there are a huge amount of government subsidies lower the costs. So if a person is eating food on the fly as many frontline workers are because of time and everything else and you live in communities in which there is a predominance of fast food establishments, 
And remember, fast food also exists inside the grocery store, not just in these fast food, quick serve drive throughs But when you go in and you're having these numbers where you can buy five burgers for a dollar, two pizzas for $5, right? Because of government subsidies that come into place, it will appear as if the cost is more favorable. That leads you down a direction of, of death and destruction, right? But here's the thing, is that when you stop and you take a look at it, the when you buy a pound of, of rice, you buy a sack of beans, the cost is not high. So my folks were from New Orleans, I said that before. And I remember as a kid growing up, my grandmother, red beans and rice were a staple. They didn't have money. They went to a local uh, charity hospital. It was called Charity Hospital. And so one of the staples that were there are these things. Quinoa wasn't something magically created. This, this came, this was food that was given to horses and things of that nature. And so we have to learn to eat like a pauper, right? So we can live like a king. And so when we get back to the basic fundamentals, I tell people all the time, buy your food frozen. So you say, okay, fresh food costs too much and that's going to, it's going to decay and spoil and so forth. Okay. I can get it from any place, a flash frozen organic frozen fruit that I can make into a smoothie or I can make into a fruit compote to put on, on top of a, a pancake or, or something of that sort. And so there are definitely mechanisms in which you can do it. It's, a, it's an issue of transforming your mind and re-looking at how we think about food. And that's a process, that's a journey. I agree. And I want to throw out one more thing about the frozen vegetables. The frozen vegetables are not only oftentimes cheaper, but they also may have more nutrients than fresh vegetables, primarily because a lot of the frozen vegetables are frozen relatively shortly after they're picked. OK, so all those nutrients that exist immediately after those vegetables were picked are kind of locked in, um, whereas fresh vegetables, they have to be transported. And sometimes uh, over time, nutrients degrade during during the transport transportation process. And they also degrade while the vegetables are sitting in the, the store, just kind of waiting for you to buy them. And then once you bring them at home, you may not necessarily eat them immediately. So that's further degradation of some of the nutrients within some of those vegetables. So I don't, I don't want to say those vegetables are bad. You should not get them. But what I'm really trying to say is frozen vegetables are a healthy, reasonable alternative, uh, especially from a price perspective. Yeah, such a great point. I mean, I think it actually can be cheaper potentially doing the whole food plant based because you can get huge stacks of dried beans. So get a lot of great protein from these, you know, inexpensive sources. And what you said is so true for prostate cancer, you know, cruciferous vegetables, things like broccoli, cauliflower are so critical, but you can have frozen vegetables. And cooked tomato products can be canned tomato paste or tomatoes. So if you're, you know, trying to incorporate some of these prostate healthy foods, it doesn't have to be fresh produce. Okay. Because Interesting. What do you think, Stacey, about uh, adding on this question? That, so the, the audience is getting really good questions and it's right on topic. So I keep feeling like we should cheat and, uh, but I wanted to ask you to, about food choices in food deserts, like the cost you're talking about is real, but if I, I send a patient to Whole Foods for a whole grain, organic foods, when it has organic on there, it feels more expensive to patients. I mean, to, to my patients, but also regular people. Yeah. What about in food deserts? It, it seems even more ridiculous. Yeah, so that is a good question. So we know that, um, unfortunately, food deserts, a lot of people are shopping at convenience stores. And convenience stores, although they're convenient and they may not even necessarily have healthy items, the cost of buying products there is oftentimes higher than it is at a supermarket. And that's something that's been well established in research. And not only, you know, you don't have to even look up the research. If you go there and you start buying, you know, potato chips and junk food at a convenience store, like, you know, the, the cost of this stuff adds up. So a lot of people bring up shopping at Whole Foods and Whole Foods uh, can be more expensive than other stores. But don't confuse Whole Foods, the, the product with Whole Foods as a store. OK, so you can buy Whole Foods at other places for a cheaper price without actually having to go to the store Whole Foods, okay? So plenty of uh, local supermarkets are gonna have uh, fresh, healthy vegetables that may or may not be organic that are gonna have a lower price point than what you would get at Whole Foods. And in terms of organic, 
you don't necessarily have to get everything organic. Okay. So you can, uh, all the vegetables you get, you have the same with fruit, you have to rinse them off. So ultimately the biggest concern with uh, non-organic vegetables is whether or not they've been exposed to pesticides. So as long as you're rinsing the vegetables off, that's going to decrease the pesticide content in the, the non-organic vegetables. So I, I think for, for, for me, and even like Dr. Baptiste said, most of my diet is going to be beans and some sort of grain and in a variety of green leafy vegetables. Uh, so beans, very, very cheap, even canned beans, especially if you're doing low sodium beans, doesn't, they don't really cost a, a whole lot. And the dried beans are, are definitely cheaper. I mean, you can buy a bag of beans for a dollar that can feed a family for, you know, almost a week uh, just with that one dollar buying beans. And same with the price of brown rice. So some dried brown rice is not very expensive. Um, and I think the biggest issue with uh, buying a lot of vegetables is that a lot of times people allow those vegetables to go to waste. So it becomes expensive if you're actually not eating what you're buying. But if you're buying everything and you're repurposing it and using all the vegetables, you can eat uh, for, you know, barely, you know, ten dollars, depending on, you know, how many people you're trying to feed. And you can eat a variety of, of vegetables just with that alone. Yes, yes, yes. So having grown up in the food desert inside of South Central Los Angeles as a kid and remember riding with my father just because I wanted to spend time and curious why we were driving about 25 miles to go to the grocery store. It's a real situation. It's a real problem and it still exists today. But the one difference between X number of years ago when I was a kid driving around my dad's car to right now is that you have many more large super stores, the Walmarts, the Targets, that also provide affordable frozen foods, canned foods, and even in many instances, fresh foods that are there. So now you have access, whereas before you didn't, even inside of these communities. And so it, once again, it's an issue of planning. And so one of the things is, is that you have to go into the store. You have to make a plan. That's always the key to success. It doesn't matter what you're going into. You have to have a plan. You go in there aimlessly looking around. Yeah, you're going to be tempted. You go in there hungry. Yeah, you're going to be inclined to get something you shouldn't get. But if you go in with a plan, a strategic plan, and your, your goal is to make your food similar to what you're familiar with, whether or not it's a bowl style, whether, whatever it may be, it can and it will be more affordable. Now, to just accentuate at uh, Dr. McDonald's point, whenever you move down the, the trajectory from pro to processed, you're increasing the cost incrementally, right? So if I move from, from dry beans or dry legumes to canned beans, the cost is going to be a little bit higher per pound. If I move from that, a plant-based protein that's rich and from legumes to now a processed uh, alternative meat substitute, it's going to be that much higher, right? So you want to backwards your trajectory and go towards the less processed, and that's going to drop your cost exponentially and make the foods very similar. Spaghetti, beans and rice, vegetables. There's a lot of different caveat, different things that we can find. Pinterest, YouTube. Dr. McDonald will give you his cookbook and go from there. We either that or we go to his house and we have a good meal. Everybody's welcome. Just, uh, well, I say everybody's welcome. My wife may say something else, but that's, that's, I don't have anything to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what do health disparities mean? And do you think that nutrition contributes? So let's start with you this time, Dr. Batiste. I know you host a series of videos called the Slave Food Project. So maybe you could talk a little bit about this whole theme and what you're doing. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And, you know, I mean, health disparities have come to light. 2020 really uncovered a lot of things inside of our world. And one of the most important things that it uncovered beyond the stress, beyond the still the persistent discrimination, beyond all these things, we, we see that there's disparities. And disparities are just simply means differences in care, see, differences. These are differences in outcomes, ways in which we can uh, help outcomes and the, the differences in the being diagnosed with certain conditions. And one of the things that we know is that many of these, what we characterize as lifestyle preventable diseases, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, stroke, all these things are all related to our lifestyle. And that the core central component of lifestyle is nutrition. Now, it's not nutrition alone for those of you out there who will kind of say, well, wait a minute, Doc, what about exercise? 
Yes, you have to keep moving. Well, what about sleep, doc? Yes, yeah, sleep, you have to get your rest. Rest is important to recharge, right? We recharge our batteries, our, our phones every single day. Well, what about your water? Yes, you have to get the water. All these things are important, but the core component is going to be the nutrition. And we look at, oftentimes we focus, we focus on the negativity, we focus on don't eat this. And we'll touch on that because it's important to understand what to watch out for. But we also have to really focus on what am I eating for my health, right? Am I eating for my health? Oh, I don't eat this, I don't do that. What do you do, right? So that's one of the key things I think is important to emphasize. And here's the crazy part is that when you look at the role of nutrition and you look at disparities that plague African-American communities, prostate cancer, heart disease, you go down the gamut, we lead across the board out of every specialty that's there, <laughs> you know? And that's the tragedy that exists that's come to light. And the sad part is I wasn't taught a lot about disparities when I was inside medical school. I wasn't taught about nutrition when I was inside medical school. I wasn't taught, yeah, I just saw it as, well, maybe I'm genetically De uh, have a genetic defect. Uh, maybe this is somehow there's, I'm broken and there is nothing broken to it. There is a concept called epigenetics that our lifestyle can turn on and turn off disease. And it's been proven time after time that through our lifestyle, whether or not colon cancer, lifestyle, whether or not it's prostate cancer, lifestyle, whether or not it's heart disease can change and transform you from illness into wellness. Wow. You, you know, it's funny. I'm a health disparities researcher and uh, it, I don't think of it as a, a personal defect when you think about these di di um, the disparities, but you're right. You could come away feeling like that. And I do think that um, instead of feeling like that, we can take action and figure out what the root cause is. That, that was actually very powerful. Thank you. Um, I have another question for you. Uh, I feel like you all just are a wealth and we just got to keep it going. Um, tell me about some nutrition tips for people with prostate cancer. Like what, what, Stacey and I, Dr. Loeb and I are both urologists and we treat a lot of prostate cancer and we focus actually on African-American men um, and kind of what happens to them once they get diagnosed. And most stuff is not in their control, right? But some of it is. Um, and I think this is why this is so great. What nutrition tips do you have for patients with prostate cancer and their caregivers, their families? So that's a, a great question. And it also, you know, it, it, it ties back into health disparities and it's something that I, I really want to impress upon our audience. So when it comes to health disparities, we have to recognize that uh, there are disparities that exist within this country, but there are also disparities that exist comparing uh, life expectancy in our country to other parts in the world, okay? So the United States is not ranked number one in the world when it comes to life expectancy. We're far from it. Uh, and oftentimes when it comes to health disparities, we are comparing ourselves uh, as uh, people of color or African-Americans uh, to other different Americans and uh, different ethnic groups. And those other ethnic groups may not necessarily do as well compared to other people around the world, okay? So our benchmark is not necessarily the healthiest benchmark on the planet to begin with. And, and I find this fascinating when it comes to the foods that we eat because it's easy to just assume that all these health disparities are solely because people are eating differently. Uh, but when you actually start looking at data, in America, we all eat a lot of junk food, okay? So for the average person in America, 60% of our calories, according to a study uh, done by the CDC, comes from ultra-processed foods, okay? So these are the superheroes of processed foods. These aren't just regular processed foods. These are processed foods that, these are foods that have industrialized ingredients that you can't even find on the supermarket. So, you know, for instance, if I try to make your favorite candy bar as a trained chef, like I couldn't just go in the kitchen and just make your favorite candy bar because I don't have the special food colorings and special emulsifiers. These are all industrialized ingredients. Yet most of our diet, regardless if you're black, white, um, that is what your diet consists of, at least 60 percent of it. OK, so and, and these are the foods that have been linked to not only potentially increased risk of uh, cancer. They've been associated with increased risk of cancer, but also they have been associated with weight gain. Okay, so when it comes to not only prostate cancer, but any form of cancer, I think eating a diet that's going to help you maintain a healthy body weight is one of the key criteria or should be a goal 
Okay. So we know that ultra processed foods are associated with weight gain. And I think one strategy before you even start thinking about supplements and how to get more of this particular nutrient, one strategy is really just cutting back or cutting out some of the junk food, which makes up majority of the ultra processed foods. Uh, yeah, we can say a ton about processed foods, a ton about processed foods. You know, I could throw out a slogan, it melts in your mouth, not in your hands. You know, you don't have to chew it. It's pre-chewed food. It just dissolves. But one of the key things, you know, I think Dean Ornish did a great job in terms of really touching base in multiple um, areas of expertise. So he did phenomenally essentially structuring cardiac rehab and showing reverse, uh, showing improvement in decreasing symptoms and lowering cholesterol for cardiovascular disease. He showed inside prostate cancer an improvement in the trend towards improvement in prostate specific antigen for, for patients who underwent stress reduction along with the various aspects that are there. And what I thought Dr. McDonald was gonna to touch on when he was starting to talk about beside the other additional X factor, um, when it comes to disparities, I thought he was gonna to speak to stress and speak to disparities, which is Stacey, that's what we talk about on the Slave Food Project is really this role, this interplay between stress that all Americans face but this unique stressor that it doesn't matter that you can't escape if you're African American, uh, the unique stressor that many people can't escape and that's a racial discriminatory stress. Now there's also other forms. There's gender bias, gender discrimination. There's also sexual orientation discrimination that's there. And all these things studies after studies have shown are layering on the idea of disparities. But when to, to answer your question, Adam, really about foods and foods and their role, we know, first of all, starting at the things that are helpful for the body and focusing on that, Stacey mentioned it already, cruciferous vegetables. Where are those? They have kind of like the curly ends, right? So your broccoli, your cauliflower, your kale, these, these things that are there. And people are like, oh, I don't want to eat that, right? Your dark green leafy vegetables, these things that you want to begin to try and play around with. They're not just garnished for the sides for your meat. <laughs> they are actually meant to be eaten, right? You look at onions. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I know go figure right so when you're out when you're out I, you're, when you're out later on having dinner i want you to have some cruciferous vegetables that are not garnished <laughs> all right uh -huh, uh -huh. yes yes sir yes sir and and one of the things is onions onions are extremely powerful have anti-cancer effects before the heart too as well they actually decrease the stickiness that's there and so extremely beneficial to you we look at tomato-based foods we're always talked about too as well. They're not problematic. They're not the enemy. We look at, at, at yellow and orange vegetables. You want the color of the rainbow. And I don't mean that candy advertisement. You want to ingest the colors of the rainbow on a regular basis. But here's one of the key things that really sticks out um, with the African-American community in prostate cancer is we look at dairy consumption. We're looking at dairy consumption, the direct link and relationship to increase in lethal prostate cancer, whether eggs and cheese and and milk products that are there is one of the things that we see. So when I'm putting up red, that, that, that lovely sign we love to talk about, red, yellow, and green, right? If we focus on the green, it's gonna be things I've mentioned already. The eggs have been shown to increase the risk of lethal uh, prostate cancer as well, right? Consumption, about two and a half of those per week. Fried foods are problematic on multiple folds, not only for blood pressure, not only for cancer, not only for, for uh, heart disease, it's all of them encompassing. And so these things in general lend themselves, we know about the, the progression and, and the animal protein and their risk to as well also has been linked uh, to these, these uh, prostate cancers and processed uh, foods. So wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, and I want to jump in also. So you mentioned tomatoes. Um, there's been a lot of literature about lycopene in the role of decreasing prostate cancer. So lycopene is the red pigment that gives tomatoes its red color. Uh, it's also found in watermelon. So I, I tell a lot of folks eating watermelon is extremely healthy for you. It's one of the fruits that one, doesn't have a whole lot of calories associated with it. Uh, two, it tastes good. And I know historically there's been some stereotypes. Uh, and I, I've even seen people feel ashamed for eating watermelon. Uh, for, for me as an African-American man who has a higher risk of uh, developing prostate cancer, there is no shame for me to eat anything that could improve my health, uh, especially that's something that can improve my prostate health. I remember I was at a conference once and one of my colleagues was, um, I was the only African-American in the room and they were serving a watermelon salad. Everybody else was eating watermelon salad. And there was a woman who came in, she was African-American. And, uh, you know, I said hi to her and I had my watermelon salad. She's just like, I can't believe 
you're eating watermelon salad in front of all these people. Like, what is wrong? <laughs> and, and, the shame. And, yeah. And, and I, I was so taken aback by that comment. Uh, so, you, you, you know, don't be ashamed to eat these healthy foods, okay? Uh, yes, tomatoes are rich in lycopene, but what's interesting, uh, sun-dried tomatoes have, have one of the higher sources of lycopene that you can get, even more so than a raw tomato. Uh, so for me, you know, I, I, I think about this when I eat my food, okay? So I may have a salad where I chop up some sun-dried tomatoes and just throw it on there. So not only are the sun-dried tomatoes delicious, not only do they add an extra level of flavor to my salad, but I'm getting more lycopene. Um, so there, I'm getting all the health benefits from it. And that's what I love about uh, doing a plant-based diet to some degree, because there's so many different foods you can eat that have so many nutrients that may be beneficial to your body. Dr. Batiste, before I let you go off with uh, another topic, uh, someone in the audience talked about supplements. It's related, so I'm, I'm adding it in here. Yes. Uh, you said your parents owned a, a health food store, right? Um, yes. Uh, do you think that there are some supplements that we should be recommending to prostate cancer patients? Absolutely. So I think, well, first of all, I'll say that if a person does choose to say, you know what, I'm going to go 100% on all the good stuff, all the green light stuff and go completely whole food plant-based, you need vitamin B12. Ensure that you're getting adequate vitamin B12. That's a key. I think the second thing that we're under treating, and it's not a vitamin, but it's sunlight. Now, obviously the risk in terms of of, of skin cancer. And so what we do as, a, as an alternative, I live in sunny California, I still don't get outside. And many people who live in urban dwellings, right, which are a lot of uh, ethnic minorities, also have low, very low vitamin D levels. And there is a relationship with prostate cancer, I believe. I hate saying things like speaking from a level of an authority with uh, experts on the, on the panel there, but vitamin D is so important for cardiovascular health. And we see it tr um, trend inside many areas. And so vitamin D is extremely important. We're seeing relationships were being shown with COVID. We're seeing relationships with cancer. We're seeing relationships um, continually as it relates to vitamin D levels. And so at first, it's important to know your vitamin D level. Get checked. That's number one. Number two is you do want to definitely supplement. Now, the recommendations may vary according to who you're listening to, but at probably at least about 2,000 units, international units of, of supplementation. I take more. I take 5,000. Uh, and so forth is what I take on a uh, day, at least if I can remember <laughs> out there, or I try and get loaded on the weekends and spend a little extra time and get 20 to 30,000. You know, if I spend a good amount of time outdoors um, during the peak sunlight period of time to absorb through my, my skin. So you picked the topic that I happen to really study a lot. <laughs> is I know. Um, yeah, I am. I was running the marathon and my vitamin D level was 37, which at the time was seven points above deficient. Mm -hmm. uh, I was outside in short shorts and short sleeve shirts five days a week running uh, and was still deficient. So the wonder, the wonders of melanin and skin protection that makes yeah. you look younger, Dr. Batiste and Dr. McDonald, and it says you ain't doing too bad either. No. But <laughs> um, is really an inhibitor for vitamin D um, synthesis in the skin. So you said exactly what I would have said. I don't have nothing else to add. Thank well, you for yeah. And I yeah, want to jump in. So there have been some studies that looked at uh, other vitamins, uh, including vitamin E and also selenium. And those studies haven't really panned out in terms of whether or not we should be recommending everyone uh, hop on vitamin E supplements and also selenium supplements. And there, there actually may even be a, a downside associated with some of the supplements. So um, to Dr. Pabtista's point, I think when we, we're thinking about supplements, the ones that I, I recommend to my patient or at least recommend my patients think about definitely would be vitamin D because of everything he mentioned and vitamin B12 because there are a lot of different reasons why people can uh, have low B12 levels. But a lot of the other supplements, I really encourage people to try to get those vitamins from food. And uh, they, uh, when you look at some of the prostate cancer literature, uh, a lot of the studies where they focus on dietary patterns as opposed to foods seem to have a stronger uh, preventive effect uh, associated with prostate cancer than just some of these supplements, with the exception of vitamin D. Vitamin D is a different story. Yeah, just to highlight that, and I know we're going to go into a different topic, but, you know, one of the things I always joke is that, you know, I'd love to have my kids energy when they were smaller, Right. 
but there's always a downside when you extract out just that energy. You may get side effects in which you may fall out in temper tantrums <laughs> and everything else. You might, if they're really small, wet the bed, whatever it may be. And so here's the thing. We always are looking for the secret ingredient and we think we're so smart. But as we've mentioned throughout this so far, the nutrients that are comprised and in, in, in contained in fruits and vegetables and whole grains, it's much more complex than we're even aware and we're learning more and more scientists uncovering more and more of this relationship between the various phytonutrients from everything from the way you chew your vegetables to the way in which they're cooked to the way in which you process the relationship with the microbiome, Dr. McDonald's area of expertise, you know, there, there's so many different areas that come into play. And that's why it's important to eat a diverse food plate with all the colors, all the fiber rich, and that's what's going to give you your best bet at achieving health. Preach. I love this. <laughs> Too good. That's fantastic. So uh, we did discuss in the title that we were going to talk a bit about sexual health. And, you know, I want to make sure to uh, leave a bit of time for that since we are moving quickly through this. Interestingly, on my radio show last night, we had the authors of the recent study in JAMA Internal Medicine looking at different diets and erections. And they were discussing how they found in the health professionals follow-up study from Harvard that uh, people who ate more fruits and vegetables had a lower risk of developing erectile problems and that people who ate more meat uh, had a higher risk of developing problems with erections, which is just so interesting when you think of just the cultural American myths surrounding like meat and masculinity or that meat is somehow um, something that would, would be good. So I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about the links between erections and sexual health with overall cardiovascular health and what foods are good for heart health and sexual health. So maybe we'll start with you, Dr. Batiste, since you're the cardiologist and you can tell us a little bit about the heart. And then hopefully later in the program, we can go back to Dr. McDonald to also touch on uh, digestion. Yeah, no, no, thanks. And, and I'm going to tell you, it is, it's, it's an overuse analogy in term, but erectile dysfunction is indeed the canary in the coal mine. It is that first thing that really occurs it's that gunshot to let you know there's a problem. Every single time I'm in the cath lab, which as of late seems to be more than not, I'm seeing in the list, a problem list, erectile dysfunction, no other medical problems. And sure enough, there's coronary disease. And so study after study has shown that there is a distinct relationship between erectile dysfunction and future cardiovascular events. And you say, why? Well, if you're 45 and older and you have, uh, without diagnosis of, of heart disease, at least 50%. <laughs> chance that you're going to be hospitalized for heart, for heart problems in the future. We know that there are in your 40s and, and beyond that the risk, if you have erectile dysfunction, the risk of having heart problems can be as high as 80% over the ensuing 10 years. There is a marked challenge as it relates to, and you may say, well, why? Why is that? Because it's a vascular issue. And so the key thing for the audience out there to know is that your heart is indeed a pump. It's just a pump. It's four chambers. It's nothing special that's there, although I think it's special. I'm in love with the heart, right? But it pumps through these tubes. Now, these tubes, these things are, have three layers that are inside of it. And the inner layer is called this endothelium. It's a singular cell that lines. And that's, this thing is incredible. It is the most predictive, the most superpower lining vessel, excuse me, uh, uh, component of the body. It's what's been implicated in the COVID price process. It's been shown that if it's dysfunctional, it's predictive of Alzheimer's, lung issues, cancer issues, all the way from head to toe, but more importantly, heart issues, right? And the vascular down inside erectile dysfunction. And so anything that damages that, that layers, you're going to end up with erectile dysfunction. So it's really not a surprise that we're seeing the impact of these highly saturated fat foods right? And so saturated fat, for the most part, is in animal products that we're seeing too as well, that we're seeing the, the, the relationship with the microbiome and the, the transition of the carnitine-rich products from animal sources that also trigger a process that leads to atherosclerosis that we're seeing there. We're seeing as well this idea and concept of aging, 
advanced glycation in products. And so it sounds like a, a crazy term, but essentially for chefs out there, it's almost like a browning effect, right? It's like when you're, for those of, of you out there who cook, when you're making your roux, all right, when you're making that gravy and you're browning that a little bit on, on the skillet that's there, you're getting that brown and that mixture, that linking between the proteins and the sugars and various aspects there, that same thing can happen in your vessels. And it's been shown to be problematic and lend itself towards disease. And this oxidative stress builds. So there's so many mechanisms on how our food plays a role in erectile dysfunction because it is indeed, majority of times, not solely, a vascular issue. It's a vascular issue. And so we have to be very aggressive in terms of our treatment for it. And the treatment goes beyond just the medications. The treatment starts and stops in your kitchen. You can't eat whatever you want and say, I'm just gonna pop a pill. But the last thing I wanna say in terms of this is that I wanna encourage folks out there who may be listening. It is not an all or none process. When you hear myself, Dr. McDonald, Dr. Loeb kind of talk or, and, and everyone talk about like nutrition, here's the catch. It's not an all or none phenomenon. There are multiple studies, most importantly, the Advanced Health Study too, that show when you begin moving from eating any and everything, and you know what I mean by any and everything, right? So you eat stuff, you have to watch and read labels saying not for human consumption because you're, otherwise you're gonna eat. <laughs> you're gonna eat that last little drop that's there. So <laughs> when you move from eating any and everything to a plant predominant diet, that we see a stepwise improvement across the board in most disease states that are there. And so that's where the power of your lifestyle nutrition comes into play. Yeah, I agree with that. And the, the study that Dr. Lowe mentioned was uh, in that study, the people who had the least amount of erectile dysfunction were on a Mediterranean diet. So a Mediterranean diet is not necessarily 100% uh, vegetarian diet. Now it's a diet that's plant focused. Uh, so a majority of the calories and nutrients people are consuming on a Mediterranean diet come from plants, but there is room for fish. And even there've been some studies that have demonstrated, uh, fish in and of itself may decrease or have associated consuming fish with a decreased risk of prostate cancer. Thank you for representing those people who are on the moderation diet. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, I, I might have to chime in with the moderation diet. So the problem with the moderation diet, it's right, not moderation. It's a, good, it, it's, a, it's a good start, but it differs with each of us, right? Yeah. But the me here's the key thing about Mediterranean that's incredible. We think of Mediterranean, we think of Italian, and we all love Italian food. We think of pizza and spaghetti and, and cheese on this, that, and the other cheese sticks. That's not the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet, as it really was uh, studied, is really a plant predominant diet. It's really a diet that's rich and where further studies have shown the most active components that were health promoting were those from the plant rich sources that were there. Um, so we have to look at, look at really our, our concept and once again, focus on what we are eating for our health. And just to, to tether back to McDonald's further uh, statement about watermelon, I've been there with you about being the one guy with eating watermelon, right? Watermelon also has been shown to be helpful for erectile dysfunction. It's one of the things you want to eat your watermelon, <laughs> right? So now all of a sudden I went from not eating watermelon to make sure I'm getting my watermelon in. It's one of the things that you want to look at. It's one of the really great comments. So I think it would be helpful to go back to some of the questions because we've got such great questions. And uh, maybe we can start with you, Dr. McDonald, and just go through what would like a breakfast, lunch, and dinner look like for you as a chef, but also, uh, you know, look at you, you're still at work, right in the middle of the action, you know, taking care of patients and with everything you do, you're so busy. So um, what are some typical foods that you would eat uh, that would be, you know, appetizing and inspiring for the listeners? Great question. Uh, so for me, myself, I mean, I'm always on the run and I have three kids. Uh, I, I do all the cooking in my household. So as a chef, I guess, the, you know, my wife expects me to do all the cooking because I went to culinary school. Um, so in the mornings I wake up and I make my kids uh, their lunch and everything. And oftentimes I do that before I even make food for myself. Um, so I'm typically the last person that I cook for. I feel like my grandma. That's like what she used to do once upon a time. So for my breakfast, I, you know, tend to do oatmeal, uh, not oatmeal packets, uh, but oatmeal that I make from scratch and oatmeal is cheap. Like oatmeal is not very expensive. Oatmeal oftentimes is cheaper than the commercial cereal that you, you can, can buy out the box. 
So I'll make some oatmeal. And what I like about oatmeal, oatmeal can serve as a foundation to add a bunch of healthy stuff to it. Okay. So I add some nuts to my oatmeal. I add uh, some frozen fruit to my oatmeal. And um, I, I not only add nuts, but also add seeds like flax seeds or chia seeds. Uh, so that gives me the opportunity to take in a lot of different types of foods and uh, uh, just one meal. Uh, and if I don't have time to make an oatmeal, I'll make a smoothie. OK, so with the smoothie, I can grab, you know, some green leafy vegetables. I can grab some fresh fruit or some frozen fruit, throw it in my blender. Uh, I don't necessarily have to, you know, use a recipe. So I try to use what's known as a simple green smoothie. Very simple. OK, uh, a cup of water, uh, a cup of green leafy vegetables and a cup of fruit. Uh, that's it. And the fruit, I, you know, I try to avoid uh, canned fruit. So my fruits aren't, you know, soaked in sugar or anything like that. I'm using either frozen fruit or fresh fruit or some combination thereof. Um, and if I don't even have time for that, I may just go around my kitchen and think about, you know, how the hunter gatherers were or really the gatherers. OK, so if you think about our ancestors, they were just grabbing berries and and, you know, leaves off of trees and stuff. I may go in my refrigerator and grab a handful of, you know, baby spinach or whatever green leafy vegetable I have, um, a handful of nuts and a handful of berries or something. And that's breakfast. Uh, that is a healthy start to my day. It's something that has protein. It's something that has fruits and vegetables. So in general, I try to start the day off with at least a serving of fruits and vegetables and a serving of nuts. And if I'm lucky, some grains. Uh, for lunch, I'm at work. Uh, typically, it's very easy for me to eat a salad at work. So for my kids, when I make the kids lunches, I always try to have some uh, some vegetables for them and also some fruit. So case in point, this morning we had watermelon. So I cut up some watermelon slices for the kids and I also uh, gave them some carrots. So I didn't even use the baby carrots. I used like regular carrots, peel the carrots, dice them up um, and also use uh, some green peppers. So I just diced up some green peppers and put it in the kids' lunches with a little bit of hummus. Uh, for me, I'll do the same thing. So I'll take those green peppers to work and the carrots, and I'll just throw it on top of uh, some baby spinach or some uh, some other type of green leafy vegetable, add some beans to it. And, you know, I have a simple salad with some protein, a couple different vegetables, and then I'm eating um uh, some watermelon or some fruit on the side. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't take much and that's not very expensive. And then for dinner, uh, I like to do, you know, salads, uh, grain bowls. So a grain bowl, um, you really just take some, uh, a whole grain like brown rice, uh, like quinoa, uh, farro. There's a lot of different types of whole grains out there, uh, but I'll cook that and throw some beans with it. And then add, you know, a bunch of different vegetables. And when you think about grain bowls, you can add uh, various ethnic flares to them, okay? So if you're trying to make some, say, Indian food, okay? So you just do some brown rice and, you know, get some tomatoes, uh, maybe some coconut milk, put a little bit of turmeric in there and grab some chickpeas. Now you have like a Indian inspired grain bowl. Uh, if you wanna do something Latin American, okay? So you take that same brown rice and instead of doing chickpeas, you get some black beans, uh, hit it with a little bit of lime juice, and then add, you can add whatever vegetable you want to it and maybe dice up some tomatoes in there. Now you have something that's Latin American inspired. And then, you know, as far as the seasoning, uh, you can cook the, the black beans with cumin or other Latin American seasonings. And then now you have that, that flavor. So what I like about the grain bowl, it is something simple that you can switch up throughout the week. And it doesn't really require a lot of time, nor does it require a lot of money. Um, other dishes that I make that I think are very simple, um, you know, for my family, my family's not vegetarian. Okay. So they like doing fish. They like, uh, other, other, you know, food options besides vegetables. So for me, cooking salmon for them, super duper simple, although salmon, you know, can be pricey depending on what you, uh, your, 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 what you can afford, but it's simple and it's quick. So when I come home from work, you know, I'm at the hospital right now. Oftentimes I come home late, uh, because I deal with a lot of emergencies, but I want to make something that's easy. And for me, putting some salmon in the skillet and throwing it in the oven, I can make salmon. I mean, that's less than 10 minutes easily. Uh, and it's so delicious. Uh, so those are just some of the things that I would eat for myself. Um, and one more thing I want to mention that we didn't talk about when it comes to erectile dysfunction. We not only have to think about erectile dysfunction, we also have to think about our sperm health. 
And what is what is truly scary is that from 1973 to about 2011 or so, the sperm health for the average man has decreased by almost 6%. Uh, and a lot of that is linked to not only the foods that we're eating, but even the foods, the way the food is packaged. OK, uh, so our foods may be packaged in, in plastics that contain uh, a chemical known as BPA, uh, but bisphenol A. Uh, and that's something that's also, you know, surrounding a lot of our ultra processed foods. So now we have to think of, uh, of food in multiple different levels. OK, so we're not only thinking about you know, the, the nutrients and chemicals within the food, we have to think about the nutrients and chemicals around the food, uh, because that may have an impact on our health. Uh, so I'm just going to put that out there. Well, first of all, thank you for talking about the sperm issue. As urologists, we are keenly aware of that decrease, and it's probably multifactorial, but I definitely think that food and endocrine disruptors are a big part of that. Um, you mentioned a good diet that you just said, Dr. McDonald. Uh, can you remix it a little bit? How you change it for the diabetics in the audience? I keep getting this on the chat. Yeah. So, you know, the diet that I mentioned is, is perfectly fine for diabetics. Okay. So everything I mentioned is uh, low sugar um, and a lot of natural sugars. And so, you know, one of the biggest misconceptions is that di people with diabetes can't eat fruit. Uh, a, a, a healthy very diet with fruits and vegetables, uh, not, you know, the fruits that are in the, the, you know, sugar stored in sugar water and syrup and stuff like that. I'm just talking about simple fruit and uh, either frozen fruits, et cetera. That's all part of a healthy diet for, for diabetics. And what I like about uh, whole foods, whole foods have fiber. Okay. So um, a lot of the junk food that people eat, uh, it's already been processed for you. So your body doesn't have to do much to digest it. And what happens is when you eat these foods that have simple sugars, uh, your insulin levels immediately spike. Uh, so these, that spike in insulin is one of the reasons why people develop diabetes in the first place. Uh, and it's also one of the reasons why a lot of times people can gain weight because insulin encourages you to, to store some of those extra calories or some of those simple sugars within your fat cells. Uh, so that's one of the mechanisms involved with weight gain. And when we think about not only decreasing our risk of prostate cancer, but even in maintaining our sperm health or even maintaining uh, our testosterone levels, uh, the extra weight that we get from our food plays a role in all of those. OK, so eating a, a, a pattern, a dietary pattern that does not involve extra calories is one that can help mitigate or prevent some of these issues that we're talking about. That's really, really helpful. Dr. Batiste, I wanna to go to you also on this question and especially the related question that came in twice now actually from the participants about higher carb counts with plant-based diets and some yeah. of the misconceptions, especially like for people with diabetes or weight loss where somehow the popular culture has this idea that all carbs are bad or that you can't eat carbs. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that from your expertise as a cardiologist? Absolutely. So we know that garbage is bad for you. Garbage is bad for you. Garbage, garbage, right? That, that's what is bad for you. Carbohydrates are not bad for you. Carbohydrates are pervasive throughout um, all plant-rich foods. They're pervasive throughout and so Dr. McDonald already alluded to this. What is garbage? Garbage are those foods, and we all know it, right? So if you have a dinner roll and it literally melts, starts to melt before you chew, that is garbage. That means it's ultra processed and refined. And so when you have these refined versus foods that really make you chew, and we've had these breads, the Ezekiel 4-9 bread, the Sprite grain breads where you're chewing for days till your jaw starts to kind of get tired, right? Your mastication muscles get, get a little worn out. Those are fiber rich and that it tends to not cause the problems. Now, here's the thing. When we look at weight loss, and I know this question always persists, there's something called your calorie density. And the more calorie dense foods are going to be your oils, the more calorie dense are going to be your, your meats, going to be your chocolates. These are your nuts are going to be more calorie dense. The ones that have the least calorie per pound are your green leafy vegetables and the most nutrients. Right. So there's an author out there, Joe Furman, who, who had an equation called the healthful nature of food equals its nutrition divided by its calorie count. Right. And you just think about it for a second. If I look at an apple, we know the calorie counts fairly low. Nutrition is high. How about apple drink? Calories high. Nutrients are pretty poor. 
that means that all of a sudden the healthful nature of that food is not very good. And so when we look at our foods, that healthful nature plus the calorie density, fruits, vegetables, whole fruits, vegetables, beans, these are going to be some of the most vital things you can do if one is concerned about their weight, if they're concerned about their overall well-being. So that plays a distinct role. Now, one of the things to add to as well is what science is really starting to uncover as we look at these dietary eating patterns of eating health promoting foods is that we find that there is a concept of deposition of fat, this intramycellular fat that ends up leading to problems with the, the absorption of blood sugar. And so now as we've had this, and then now we're eating other foods that may be a little bit higher and more refined in carbohydrates, we see the sugar just increase as we measure our blood sugar. I can tell you patient after patient who has transitioned towards eating not partial, not eating honey buns or eating things of that nature, but eating really whole foods, that their blood sugar has normalized, that their blood sugar, I'm, I gave a lecture to a Canadian group and I was asked by a, a nonprofit I, I, I associate with. And so one of the execs asked me to, to just talk with me. So I started just, I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll coach people just for the fun of it, just because I love stories. And so he's become a story, which I love. And so over the past four weeks, he's dropped 20 pounds. His blood sugar has normalized. His blood pressure has normalized. His, you know, and so he's seen these phenomenal things by what? By eating a whole food plant-based diet as the predominance of his dietary intake. So we see this, it's a myth that carbohydrates are bad, but it's an actuality when we have processed foods. The last analogy I'll give you is think of potato chips. We can eat potato chips endlessly. Many people can probably eat a pound of French fries, but you can't eat several baked potatoes. You can't eat just several sweet potatoes. Why? Because the fiber fills you up first. The fiber is filling, and now you're triggering the whole process, the hormonal cascade between ghrelin and leptin. Um, so that, that's, that's one of the things I want to mention to you as well. And last thing for those who are diabetic out there, just simply walk 10 minutes after every time you eat. After you eat, studies have shown that it will help the metabolism of the blood sugar and you'll lower. That's one simple tool that you can do. I know the focus is nutrition, but that's a simple tool. Just get up and walk, move a little bit. Fantastic. So we had a few questions that came in in the chat about eggs. If you maybe want to tag team on that topic and, uh, you know, are eggs healthy? I seem to recall there was some big study that was out in one of the JAMA journals this past year about egg consumption related to cardiovascular disease or heart health. Can you discuss are eggs okay or are eggs a concern as well? Yeah, go, go ahead, Dr. McDonald. I'll jump in after you. Yeah, I can speak to that. So there have been several studies that have come out in the past, you know, four or five years. Actually, one of my former co-residents wrote one of those studies out of Northwestern. Um, so there was one study that said, OK, doing three eggs per week is fine. Um, then there's another study that comes out and says, well, no, maybe not so fine. That's been associated with uh, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So, you know, eggs can be high in cholesterol and uh, cholesterol can be one of the, the, the risk factors. Cholesterol consumption can be one of the first factors that can be associated with cardiovascular disease. So, you know, in general, I tell people um, when it comes to moderation, doing eggs every single day, it's probably not necessarily the best thing, especially depending on how you prepare eggs. Because oftentimes, you know, when we talk about eggs, we're, we're, we're really not just talking about eggs. We're talking about the butter the eggs are cooked in. OK, we're also talking about the cheese that people put on top of the eggs. And that's that's a factor. OK, so a lot of times when we're eating eggs, it's not just an egg by itself. Most people aren't necessarily doing just one hard boiled egg. Um, so egg whites may be better. I saw that pop up in the chat. But in general, you know, if I think what would be a healthy strategy, um, you know, for some people who really want to have eggs because they can be a source of protein, I understand that. Um, doing it every now and again uh, may be reasonable, but there's other studies where we just don't know. And it's one of those things that has been controversial, okay? So I can't say eggs are 100% bad. I can't say they're 100% safe, um, but I can say that there's literature out there that exists that points to some concerns and, you know, maybe those concerns aren't realistic, but for me trying to play it safe, I'd rather have a diet that is rich in foods that um, haven't really been 
uh, haven't really generated concerns. OK, so I haven't seen a study that says spinach is going to kill me. OK, I haven't seen a study that says, you know, kale is going to increase my risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, so most of my diet it includes the foods that have been associated with positive benefits uh, as opposed to foods that have been associated with negative benefits or where there's controversy, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I just to echo what he mentioned, I, I, I'll tell patients all the time, you know, using that red light, green light, yellow light uh, analogy. I very rarely drive through a, a yellow light. Why don't I drive through a yellow light? Because the risk of me encountering an accident or a ticket or something of that sort increases exponentially. So why am I going to, to rush through? The other scenario, and so eggs definitely fall in that yellow category, where is it really health promoting? Is it really harmful? It may be in this yellow zone where there's some sparse of data that suggests it may not be as bad, but at the end of the day, it boils down to what question are you asking? Is this really about, if it's about protein, okay, you can get your protein from a numerous sources. If your question is about how can I optimize and decrease my chance as much as possible to decrease the burden of, of risk for prostate cancer and for heart disease and so forth, for me, the choice becomes easy at that point. I'm once again, choosing to focus on the things that have been established beyond a shadow of a doubt, that are green light foods, that are foods that are going to help promote my health. And that's what I try and surround my diet, my plate with on a regular basis. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, um, before this webinar started, we had a bunch of questions that were submitted online in advance. And there were some questions surrounding meat. Uh, maybe I'll start with Dr. McDonald related to the relationship between um, red and processed meat with colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, and other health conditions? Yeah, so uh, there are, there's definitely a body of literature that exists that have associated uh, red meat, uh, which would be beef, pork, and lamb, uh, with prostate cancer, and also uh, processed red meat, so these would be your sausages, your bacons, uh, pepperoni, et cetera. So, you, you know, for me, my family's from the South, okay? I grew up in a household where barbecuing was, you know, it was tradition, but it was part of the culture. And for me, even as a, a plant-focused physician, I guarantee you, I can probably put together some of the best barbecue in Chicago, okay? I mean, that, that is the, the cultural legacy that I was raised in. However, what, what made me uh, not only transition to more of a plant-based diet uh, was really looking at some of the literature surrounding colon cancer. And it's one of the reasons why I don't barbecue with the frequency I once did, even for my own family, even if I'm not necessarily eating the food. So um, when we cook foods with high heat cooking techniques, specifically red meat, um, the high heat that we apply to the foods uh, that creates the char marks, those grill marks, they look beautiful, but those grill marks are not necessarily innocent, okay? So within those grill marks, they may be cancer-causing agents cause carcinogens, and specifically, um, uh, if you want to get to specific names, so we're talking about uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, we're also talking about nitrosamines. Uh, so these are all different chemicals. If consumed frequently, they've been associated with cancer. So what, I want to point out the word association, okay? So I can't tell you that meat causes cancer. OK, because we don't have the studies um, that are structured to demonstrate that. OK, so to show that meat causes something, you'd have to take babies from the day they were born and just feed them nothing but meat and babies who didn't eat any meat. And then like wait 30, 40 years and see who has more cancer. Uh, that would be completely unethical. Um, but we have these population studies where they do food questionnaires, okay? So they'll ask people over, you know, 20, 30 years to see, okay, you know, who's eating what? And the researchers can then look back and say, well, look, you know, we found more cancer. And the people said they, the, the group of people that said they ate more meat. I can't say that they had more cancer because they were eating meat, but there may be an association. We don't know. Um, so when it comes to colon cancer, uh, that association is definitely there. And then there's also an association for a decreased risk of developing colon cancer when you're eating foods that are high in fiber, uh, which would be, again, more of the fruits and vegetables. So I, I want to get away from the whole concept like this food is bad, this food is good. I really want to focus on dietary patterns, okay? Because, you know, if you eat barbecue, you know, 
once in a blue moon, that's not going to be a thing that's going to take years off your life. But if all day, every day, you're outside grilling all the time, that may not necessarily be the best dietary pattern for you, especially if that grilling is in the context of the standard American diet, where you're not just grilling, you're also eating a lot of junk food and processed foods, etc. cetera. Um, but when you have this healthier dietary pattern where you're getting all these foods that have different nutrients that may protect not only against prostate cancer, but colon cancer, because there's overlap. Majority of the stuff that we're talking about that can de- that have been associated with a decreased risk of prostate cancer, it's been associated with a decreased risk of a lot of different things, not only cancer, but even cardiovascular disease. So if that is where most of your diet lies, then you're getting more of the health benefits, okay? Uh, and you may actually have more license to eat that, you know, that, that may even offer some protection when you do have that barbecue or whatever, you know, sweet food you want, because most of your diet is pretty much healthy. That's not gonna be the one thing that's gonna tip the scale for you. Dr. Batiste, do you have anything to add? No, I I think you summarized it well. I I think one of the key things is once again, just be very mindful of of what you're doing and your your choices. I think that that's really the key as you go down the road in terms of your food. Uh, We all have come from a various culture. We have family dynamics that resonate with us. It, It entails like our memories. And that's really how appetizers really key into us and clue in to really tether us to some of these foods is based on our memories that we formed from childhood. And so we know that we're, uni- we're uniquely linked to it. But what I challenge folks to do is to, to, to focus on those foods that can build resiliency inside your body from a health standpoint, right? You know, I like to talk about that your health is tied to resiliency divided by stress. And so you're going to have stressors and everything that you do in life is either adding to resiliency or adding to stress. And food as flavorful as it is, as much as we don't like to think of it in terms of medicinal practices, it is indeed medicinal. And so, and so I, would, I would encourage you that most folks out there are not getting in it, uh, their daily amounts of fruits and vegetables and whole grains. And if you just focus on that, on what you are eating for your, your health, I challenge you this, get a calendar and commit to something. Don't just say, I'm going to have fruit. Be very specific. Is it going to be an apple? Is it going to be berries? Is it going to be bananas? Whatever it is. Commit to how much are you going to have? Don't just say, I'm going to have vegetables. Say, okay, is it going to be spinach? Is it going to be green leafy lettuce? Is it going to be cauliflower? Now what you do is I want you now to get on your calendar and I want you to put an X every single day you get in those ingredients. Start with fruit first, start with vegetables, whatever you choose and watch it. The key is don't break the chain. Don't break the chain, keep it going and see the count, see the marks take place. Begin to add to those marks for fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, legumes, seeds, water, exercise, and you're going to see your health transform as you see those X's begin to go in a row and in a sequence. And that's the key, focusing on the positive. A positive mindset plays powerful role in our bodies and our life. We speak solely about things that are tangible. But there's a role of something called the placebo. <laughs> and every placebo is the gold standard that we measure our double-blinded tests. And, there, and we see the placebo can have beneficial effects. But our placebo is wrapped in the social context in a way in which it's delivered. It's, it's wrapped as far as in your belief system. But the studies have shown the mind is powerful. And so I, that's what I would challenge you to do is to, to understand that there is power in lifestyle. It's not something that's something that you do just because there's nothing else to do, there is power in it. And so that's what I want to encourage you. Yeah, I agree. Dr. Batiste and Dr. McDonald, first of all, you are just huge wealth of information. Uh, I feel like, you know, I am eating too many eggs right now and I'm going to stop and not bake the cookies that I have in here right now. (laughs) No, no, seriously. can you tell us a little bit, of Dr. Batista, about the, the Slave Food Project a little bit? Because I think that it's unique and worth yeah. sharing with the audience. Well, you know, obviously I'm passionate about lifestyle. I'm passionate about making a difference beyond just the traditional uh, areas of, of cardiology. And so what I've realized is the fact, as we've discussed throughout this talk, is that there's huge health disparities. And the health disparities, telling someone just to eat without giving them the background as to why perhaps they're eating the way that they're eating, without looking at the role as it plays from a historical standpoint, but really in current events in terms of the structure of our neighborhoods. The fact that our foods that we're ingesting, we live in communities that are crucibles of conflict that lend to stress 
that lend to discrimination too as well, that heighten the burden of disease, that now it's ignited by nutritional stress, by the foods that surround us that are harmful. They're disease forming, not health forming, they're disease forming. And so as a result of this, it should be no surprise that we're seeing that America is living sicker and dying sooner. And within the subculture of America, people of color are living sicker and dying sooner. And so that's what the Slave Food Project is. It's a historical piece because I love history. In another life, I would have been a history professor, right? So it gives us a, a taste of history. That it's also an aspect of, of, of looking at the role that's been exposed through like uh, authors like Michael Moss, through like the likes of, 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 of The Color of Law, Richard Rothstein, bringing out redlining, with throughout the likes of, of of Neil Bernard from Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine digging in into depths and seeing really what happens in terms of the legislation that leads to advertisement that our tax dollars pay for that promote the foods that are killing us. The, the discordance between what the recommendations are for a healthy plate, but yet what the government subsidizes and tells you to eat. So on one side of the mouth, they're saying eat healthy. The other side of their house, mouth, they're putting money towards food that's leading to our detrimental um, outcomes. And so the key is to inform, but I'll, I'll be honest, the secret sauce in the slave food project, it's not about historical slavery, it's about that we all are enslaved. And I always tell the story all the time. I remember when I started out in this health journey and I remember I, I had the grocery ba basket loaded with all these good things and it was putting it on there. And you know what surrounds you in those lines on the grocery store, the aisle right there. I'm standing there waiting and all of a sudden it was like a movie that Denzel was in when he grabbed the vodka and he just grabbed it last minute. I grabbed the candy bar off of it, looked to the right and looked to the left. I put it on the conveyor belt and I never forget the words from the checkout clerk. He said, man, I thought you were health. I, you were the healthiest person I'd ever seen come through this line until I realized you're just like us. And what he meant by that is I'm just as addicted that despite, despite my desires to eat healthfully, I'm still somewhat tethered to these foods that are displayed and they're, they're in the increased predominance inside certain communities. And that's what Slave Food Project is about. And it's about leaving folks that there is liberation, that there's a new way, that there is a plant scription that you can receive towards a wholeness of health that leads you to engaging in activity and to sleeping and, and to, to giving your body periods of rest with intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating and, and, and focusing on what you are doing for your health. And that's what the Slave Food Project is about. And that's what our goal is, is to, to do exactly what you all are doing, to highlight the work, to really bring this to fruition so we can change lives beyond our white coats, our stethoscopes, our pills, and our procedures. Dr. Batiste, please uh, type in your way that people can follow you or either on social media or a website you have, put in the chat box for people to look at because, I mean, that's inspiring to lots of people. I mean, and, and a lot of the comments from the chat or about kind of systemic racism and social determinants of health and how it feeds into the dietary choices. So I think people will learn a lot. Definitely. So I'll just say you can you can definitely go YouTube. Slave Food Project is the easiest way to catch some of the prior broadcasts. Like we had a great gastroenterologist on, and um, I'm waiting <laughs> to bring on these two. I'm waiting to bring on these two urologists. I'm I'm gonna hit them up after afterwards via email. But we had this incredible incredible culinary gastroenterologist. I'm just saying, I'm not sure if you guys know him or not. <laughs> you, you know, that, that, that was a good show. I, I felt like, honestly, when I came on the show, we were just hanging out, man. Yeah, definitely, That's definitely. Amazing. It was good, it was really good vibes. Great. great show. So I wanna make sure we have enough time for both of you to discuss some resources. And there were some really excellent comments in the chat about um, you know, especially marginalized communities, not having um, nutrition education, and um, some really important suggestions about, you know, community health workers and ways that we and the medical community and its scientific researchers could perhaps work on this issue more. For, from a practical sense, for those listening here today and those who may listen in the future to this webinar once it's posted, can you share some you know, helpful documentaries, websites. Um, I know Dr. McDonald has the blog and um, his own recipes. Um, personally, I think the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine or PCRM, their 
They have extensive resources on diabetes and recipes and things like that. Do you guys have some favorite sources of some information for people who may have been inspired today to go for more information? Oh, yeah, definitely. So, you know, for folks in the Chicago area, uh, I do a lot of cooking demonstrations and education in the community. Uh, so I have a grant where uh, we took over a whole community. So we took over the Oakwood Shores community and uh, I do uh, cooking demonstrations with uh, Ad Dr. Adam Murphy is a part of that. Uh, and also organization called Family Farm, an organization called Common Threads. And our participants uh, who participate in those demonstrations, they get the food that we're cooking for free. Uh, so they cook along with us and we deliver the food for them, uh, which is a, a beautiful example. And uh, another thing, I, I do a cooking class in Inglewood, a neighborhood on the south side, uh, with the Salvation Army. So people come in for free and we go over healthy recipes and we do it on Saturdays. Uh, I just do it because I like to do it. So as far as resources, um, there's a, a good uh, website, Foodways. Uh, so if you're interested in healthy African American, you know, style of eating, Foodways has a, uh, a lot of good examples. Uh, if you're interested in really uh, getting a kind of a breakdown of some of the nutritional issues, but, you know, having it in a way that's easy to understand, I think uh, nutritionfacts.org is very good. And they have these brief videos, these blurbs that are just so well put together by uh, Dr. Michael Greger, who's a nice guy. Um, there, if you're interested in actually cooking, um, there is a uh, uh, website called the Plant Trition Project. And on the Plant Trition Project, um, they have a relationship with this online culinary school called Ruby, uh, R O U X B E. And they have a healthy, kind of plant based eating uh, curriculum uh, where all these videos that basically show you how to cook. Uh, I think that curriculum is phenomenal. I've had a lot of my patients sign up for it, uh, especially for people who are interested in kind of transitioning to more of a plant-based diet or people who are just interested in trying to cook vegetables more. So I think that's a great resource for recipes, but also the videos that show you how to get the skills. Because, you know, recipes are one thing. Um, I tell people you, you don't want to be kind of imprisoned by recipes. You want to get techniques and skills where you can just make your own recipes and just learn how to cook as opposed to now you have to look at the recipe. It's almost like playing music. Um, so I want to teach people how to play chords as opposed to just, you know, reading music and playing exactly what it, what the sheet music says. Like you need to learn how to, the, the theory behind all this stuff. And now you're free to do whatever you want with it. Um, yeah, I, I, I call that cooking by ear. Yeah. Instead of playing by ear, cooking by ear. <laughs> exactly. So as a person who is, who's matured in my cooking skills, the recipes were really helpful in the beginning until you knew how to use seasoning to get what you wanted out of it. Um, so you are like in the advanced 300 level courses right now. <laughs> I wanted to ask you a question, Dr. McDonald, because I think you do this really well. Tell them about your blog, because there's a lot of questions in the chat about salt, egg, um, very, very specific things that you kind of cover in your blog. Can you talk a little about the blog you do? Yeah. So, you know, the blog is a resource that um, initially was just started with my patients. I had all these patients that would come and ask me questions. And I, you know, I'm one of the doctors who loves to just spend time just answering everybody's questions. Um, but that takes time. OK. And it really takes time to give the, the, the questions, the answers they deserve. And the powers that be, they were like, Dr. McDonald, why is your clinic always late? Why are you spending an hour for everybody? You can't do that. And I decided to create the blog as a way to, as a resource for my patients. So I, when someone asked like Dr. McDonald, you know, how much sugar is too much sugar? Oh, I have an article about this. Okay. I want you to look at this resource. Okay. I want, and this resource breaks down, you know, that four grams of sugar is the equivalent of a sugar cube. So now when you understand that, you can look at the food labels and interpret the amount of sugar that you're actually getting. It's a problem with food labels. Everything's in the metric system. Like in the United States, you, you know, no one knows how much they weigh in kilograms. If you went outside, you couldn't tell me the temperature in Celsius. Uh, but the resources that we use to actually understand what we're eating, we're using uh, a system that we don't really use. Uh, so in my blog, I kind of explain things in a way that people uh, that's easy to understand for the everyday person. And, and what I like about it, I love when I get a message from someone who may have a PhD or may you know, be a doctor 
and say like, man, I read that article and I learned something. But that same article, someone who may not necessarily even graduated from high school may send me a message like, man, I learned something. Um, and I, I, I use a lot of uh, evidence, but I try to I try to present it in a way that's engaging and even humorous. So I use some funny stories and stuff like that. But a lot of stuff that I write about is really just dictated by my patients. These are questions that my patients are asking me or questions that I get when I do cooking demonstrations for churches and various community events. So, wow, it's 826 and we are, and it's ended in four minutes. So you all have packed that in. I didn't ask half the questions I went to ask. Um, but you've all been like literally amazing. I think I'm changing several things about what I do in my life now. Um, like less barbecue, more watermelon, and eating it in public. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to let you guys know a couple things that we're doing at us too uh, to kind of get more in depth about this topic. One of them is we're actually starting a Black men's prostate cancer support group that's going to be virtual. Um, COVID has taught us that, like this webinar itself, you can reach a lot of people more than any one space, one church, one community center, by doing things virtually and advertising for them. So we're, that's a big need. We're starting that now, and we're hoping to have it off the ground by late April, early May. And then um, us two is really, really good at doing active um, prostate cancer support groups. They have over 200 across the country and in the US, across the world. Um, and so uh, we're gonna have to bring you guys back to for some of these future events. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to do it for free, but, I'm <laughs> but we will ask you back. And then I want to also just tell you that this was, it's been a labor of love for me and Dr. Loeb, uh, but we actually were supported by uh, several organizations, including the Fighter Foundation, obviously uh, us two, uh, international, this, the state of Illinois. Uh, and so we've had really good support around this project. And I think it's great to see people take it so seriously, including a pharmaceutical company uh, that's Janssen that we call mm -hmm. medicine. So I just really want to take time to thank you guys as panelists uh, and our sponsors for putting this together. Um, and if there are any last minute burning questions, we should give it to the audience, right? Definitely. So one person mentioned several times uh, the role of community health workers, people who, to help us educate communities of color. What do you all think is the best to do? What, what is the role of community health workers and, and what can we do to get the word out more broadly uh, to affect communities of color? We definitely need community health workers. Uh, so I, I had a grant here at University of Chicago uh, working with the Comprehensive Care Center here. And uh, I came up with their nutrition curriculum and I did all the cooking demonstrations. But the community health workers, they were really the foundation. OK, so even though I would show up and cook and provide the education, they would you know, address who had food insecurity issues. Uh, they would reach out to make sure that people knew about my cooking demonstrations and not only make sure they knew about them, they would make sure that they had transportation and resources to, to, to get here. So they were the, the backbone. And, 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 and you know, I, I think more hospitals uh, definitely need to embrace community health workers because uh, we need to not be stuck in the ivory towers of our hospitals. We have to get out into the community and the community work, health workers, not only community health workers, but developing community partnerships is, um, I would say 100% necessary to do that community work. Um, and it's one of the reasons why myself, I'm, I'm out here in the community um, and it's not just for the sake of benefiting people in the community, it's also for my benefit. Um, like I need to be out in Inglewood, I need to be in the streets, even though you know I came from a humble background to some degree, but I, I need to, to stay in touch with those roots to make sure I'm effective at what I'm doing, if that makes any sense. So absolutely, absolutely. I'll say that we have to tether to trusted organizations that, that the communities um, that they're engaged in. So whether or not it's churches, whether or not it's any other types of clubs and collaborate and connect us, you all are doing great work. And that's one of the, the, the real parts of the initiative is going around and um, connecting with them, collaborating, right? And being that central part, uh, addressing the issues in the community 
with their needs, not my objective, but their objective. And it needs to be something that inspires folks to go and be about change and do those things like um, uh, showing them how to shop or if, whether or not it's virtual or it's in person, but showing them how to cook simply and affordably and be able to smell the flavors and the taste and understand that there is a difference, giving them screenings and giving them education. And that's really the key. So all these things are extremely important. So I think we should let you all have the last word, guys. You are the experts. Uh, I just want to say thank you one last time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lowe, for leading this off and letting me partner with you on this. She's a radio host with the most uh, and Dr. Radio on Sirius XM, Channel 110, and I listen very, very often. Uh, and I'm going to start listening to Dr. Batiste all the time. Uh, and, and watching you on YouTube. So, and I already followed Dr. McDonald, I stalk him. So <laughs> he's used to me. I just really wanna say thanks to everybody. Likewise, I'll lead off. I, I wanna thank both of you for the invitation. And, and I, I'll tell you, I'm inspired. You know, there's a saying that iron sharp, sharpens iron. And so I'm inspired by the work that you all do and about the efforts of giving, going beyond yourself and beyond your practice to give back to the community. And not about giving back, it's, you know, we don't get a kudo for taking care of our kids. That's what we're supposed to do. This in kind is what we're supposed to do. <laughs> we're supposed to be about the community, about changing lives and so forth. So you all are doing it, all three of you. And so I'll tell you, I've been, I've received more than I've shared or maybe anyone has, has received from me today by just listening and observing from your moderation to Dr. McDonald's knowledge set. And so I wanna thank you all. And anytime you all wanna collaborate, you know how to get in touch with me. I'm happy to. Thanks guys. So I would say the same thing. You, you know, I've always been inspired by Dr. Murphy. I've known him since I was a medical student. And uh, Dr. Baptiste, uh, it's a, a pleasure. I met you when I was a uh, fellow and you spoke at a conference. I'm like, I need to be like that guy talking about food. And I think he was the only, Af only person of color who was speaking at the conference. Uh, so Dr. Loeb, uh, like I said, you were also my hero. So it, it's really a, a pleasure to be here. And to the audience, especially the men in the audience, I, I want to impress upon you all the joy of cooking. OK, so I know we talked about different types of foods and everything, but I think most importantly, I want to encourage men to cook because generationally there's been this issue of cooking and gender roles. And if there's any you know, example of toxic masculinity, it would be that. Uh, the fact that we think because we are men, we should not be in the kitchen. And I've seen people, uh, I've seen their health be severely impacted by that concept, okay? Uh, either they're not cooking themselves and they're relying on processed foods. So when you do that, you put the control of your health in, the, somebody, in someone else's hands, okay? That is not ideal or they're allowing someone to cook for them. And that person may or may not necessarily understand their health concerns uh, or may you know, completely care about the health concerns, or they may not even feel the, the, the agency to actually ask that person to cook differently. And I've seen it plenty of times where men come in and the people who are cooking for them don't wanna change the way they're cooking. Uh, so their high blood pressure just stays high. Uh, their cholesterol stays high because they're not in control of the foods that they're eating. So for all the people out there, it is okay for you as a man to cook. And, and resources, uh, I mean, research shows that uh, men of color, uh, unfortunately, compared to other groups, may cook less than some of these other groups. Uh, and that is something that needs to change, especially you know, if you're trying to eat a healthy diet, you have to be in control of the foods that you're preparing. Great. Well, thank you. Well, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today and especially for all the engaged questions. We had uh, over 50 questions submitted in advance that we did our best to compile and we had so many more that came in during this and we did not even get to all of them. And we do plan to send a follow up email to this so we will share some more resources and do our best to make sure that you are covered with some of the questions that we did not get to today on the live broadcast. So thank you so much, everybody. All right.